I'm Jessica Rinded for Ivy Times TV, reporting from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, and joining me today is Keith Bliss of Catone. Now, today is that huge day everyone has yes. been waiting for, waiting for that big Fed announcement, and they ended up not tapering. And a lot of people thought there was going to be this light taper scenario where they're going to scale back about five to ten billion dollars, and that didn't happen. What was the reaction on the floor to that? Well, uh, today was like Christmas morning, you know, <laughs> wait, waiting for it in anticipation. And on Christmas morning, not only did we get an Xbox, but we got an Xbox in about 20 of the hottest games uh, with the no taper result. I mean, it was, it was absolutely extraordinary, as you're pointing out. Everybody that I spoke to, clients, colleagues, economists, all expected at least a modest taper for the Fed just to show the market that they've been laying the expectations for a taper. and. Everybody knew, that's why the market has been reacting in the last month, everybody knew that $10 billion was going to be meaningless uh, to the overall program, the overall market, the overall economy. But I think for them to come out and say no taper while the equity markets have cheered it and the S&P spiked to all-time highs as a result, they're also telling us that there are issues inside of the U.S. economy that they're very concerned about, not only fundamentally from a pure economic standpoint, but one of the other things they said is they're absolutely scared to death of the fiscal shenanigans that are going on in Washington right now and the seeming intransigence from both the administration and the Congress to get anything done. There's a lot of risks out there. Now, speaking of the U.S. economy, it's been now five years since the Lehman collapse, and now we're on our third phase of quantitative easing. And we are seeing this disconnect between, you know, the equity market, which is, you know, we're seeing this all-time highs now, especially after this announcement, versus the overall U.S. economy. We're not seeing that jobs growth that QE was supposed to provide right. to. Is there... Is this really what they thought would happen? It doesn't seem like we're seeing what QE was supposed to provide for the economy. Well, remember, quantitative easing was something that was formed in a petri dish in a mad scientist laboratory to begin with. I mean, the, 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 the typical policy response to a weakening economy is just to keep short-term interest rates low, put money into the banks, and then, then lend it out to the businesses, and that's how you spur growth and you spur spending. But the traditional transfer mechanisms have broken down. Companies uh, are unwilling to come to the bank window to borrow money. Banks are unwilling to lend a lot of money for a variety of reasons, too, too numerous to mention here. So the basic transfer mechanism is broken down. That's why QE was created. Any economic data point that you look at which signifies growth inside of the U.S. economy, whether it's GDP, whether it's income growth, whether it's job growth, um, those are all very weak and have been for the last five years. So again, that's why I'm very curious about the Fed's move today. It's, it's pretty apparent to all of us. They're clearly smarter than, than me, Dr. Bernanke is. Uh, but I, I study these things, I look at these things. It's been clear to me that the quantitative easing program has had diminishing marginal returns for some time. So I can't really understand why they continue to expand their balance sheet when they're pushing on a string trying to get the economy started. I, the, only, the only other thing I come to is they're very concerned that we've seen the spike in rates and how it started to really impact the nascent housing recovery. So they're going to go ahead and hit that with a fire hose as much as they can and try and keep the long end of the curve low as long as possible. Because let's face it, housing in the U.S. economy is really the epicenter. So they need to keep that vibrant. Now, we've talked in previous interviews about how this quantitative easing program has sort of reached the max that it can do right now. How much longer do you think they can really continue, and are there other tools that they can use to try to help the U.S. economy overall? Well, I think that one of the things that they're looking at is they're not only looking at bond rates, but they're also looking at exchange rates. As long as the dollar is not collapsing and as long as gold and other commodities are not spiking, they probably have room to think that they can print money ad infinitum uh, as long as there are willing buyers out there for the uh, out there for the uh, for the dollar and the other commodities and you're going to keep those things in an equilibrium with other with other uh, currencies uh, then they'll keep going I, but again I just as you're pointing out they're just there's very little impact of what they're doing now inside of the economy and one of the other finer economic data points you can look at is the velocity of the m2 money supply this is getting pretty technical here but but it's at its low what it what it does is it signals how vibrant the U.S. economy is because it tracks how quickly a U.S. dollar turns over inside of the economy. So the theory being the more money you put out there, the faster it turns over, the more economic activity you have. It's at its, the velocity of M2 is at its lowest level since it's ever been recorded. So where's the money going that they put out there every month? It's going into asset markets. It's coming into the equity market. We saw that today. We're going to keep putting out $85 billion. Let's go buy stocks. And when you look at the overall U.S. economy, we have seen over the last year since they started the Q3 phase, um, the unemployment rate has gone from just over 8% down to about 7.3%, what the government is reporting. However, 
the overall um, the labor force participation rate is at its lowest in about 35 years. Yep. So when they do say once unemployment reaches about six and a half percent, seven percent, is that really a good goal target to start either tapering off or rising interest rates when really unemployment is still a huge issue? There are, there are so many people dropping out of the labor force. Well, that's right. I mean, listen, you can, uh, basic mathematics, you can get to your product by manipulating either the numerator or the denominator. Um, and right now, it's the denominator that's being manipulated because the labor force participation is going down dramatically. More importantly, it's not only at its lowest level, but it's around 63.2% or some, somewhere in that neighborhood. Back in 2000, the labor force participation rate was almost 68%. So when you think of a country of 300 million people, that's a huge number of people that have dropped out of the labor force. Some is due to retirement, but some have just given up looking for employment because there's no job growth. That will have an impact on the unemployment rate. So yes, the unemployment rate has come down, but less people are still working, and that's the problem. The bigger, the bigger issue, though, which we learned this week, is that real wage growth in this country has stagnated, and in fact, people most people in this country, certainly in the middle quartile of people in the United States, are still earning less than they did in 2007. When you factor in even a slack inflation rate of 2%, they've had a real cut into their uh, purchasing power in this country, and that's going to be a real problem going forward. That's got to get straightened out quickly because any kind of economic recovery will stall in this country because we're 70% consumer spending and the pe people are running out of money and they're extending their credit. So these are real issues inside the economy I think the Fed is mostly concerned about. I think they're really running out of tricks up their sleeve at this point, and they're going to keep buying bonds and hope that at some point the pipe will become unstuck. And finally, Bernanke's term does expire in January, and many people think that he won't be appointed for another term. Now, because of that, a lot of people thought that they would start tapering now because of this sort of legacy issue, you know, they don't want him to leave and someone else new come in. When do you think we will see them start to taper? It's pretty clear he's not going to get another term. I mean, uh, gosh, the, pre the president has just about come out and said that. And, and, and unfortunately for the president, his guy uh, got a very negative reaction, including for most people in his party, for whatever reason. So the, uh, the person that's most the likeliest suspect at this point is Janet Yellen. And she's, uh, listen, she's a dove like, like Chairman Bernanke. So I don't think, they'll, I don't, I, it, it, there's a strong possibility that they won't taper before he leaves his, his post, because my guess is, if Vice Chairwoman Yellen is appointed her first press conference, she's probably going to stand up and say, we're going to continue the same policies that my predecessor did for the last five years. So what's the sense in even tapering? I mean, if they're really concerned about the economy, they, they care little about who's sitting in the, in the chairperson seat.